بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This afternoon we take a brief look at a topic that is referred to as Fitna to al-shubuhat wa shahawat And I guess in order to make things clear We can begin with defining each of these words very briefly Beginning with the word fitna Fitna um, is used to mean many many things In the Quran and in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam But what do we mean by fitna with respect to the topic that we are covering this afternoon so when we speak of fitna we will be speaking of trials tests tribulations afflictions temptations so basically this is what we are referring to when we speak of al fitna particularly for our topic whereas if you go to the quran and the sunnah as i said it could come with many different meanings it could mean punishment Okay, um, and so forth. Anyhow, so we're going to be talking about fitna as tests, trials, and temptations, more or less. Then we have the issue of ashahawat and ashubuhat. Ashahawat is the plural of shubha, uh, ashahawat is the plural of shahwa, and shahwa basically refers to desires, things that a person wishes for and is keen on acquiring or may actually strive to acquire or attain desires in general desires in and of themselves are not necessarily bad there are some things that a person desires and they are prescribed in our sharia ah. an individual desires to get married an individual desires a certain type of food as long as it is within the confines of the sharia, ah, then it's mubah. It is something which is permissible and it is, it is allowed. But when that shahwa or that uh, desire causes one to deviate, causes one to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and indulge in sin, uh, then of course it is blameworthy. It is those types of desires that are not... Uh, incurs in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so if they, uh, if those desires encourage one uh, to engage in sin or to commit sins or to disobey Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, then those are the desires that are impermissible and that one has to stay away from. That is, as far as a shahawat is concerned. As for a shubuhat, when we speak of a shubuhat, a shubuhat is the plural of shubha which means a doubt, a misconception, a misunderstanding, a confusing between truth and falsehood, 
wala talbisul haqq bil batil as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we are not to uh, confuse between uh, truth and falsehood so shubuhat then basically refers to uh, doubts things that are unclear and misconceptions so let's begin when we talk about the fitna of shahawat and shubuhat then when it comes to the issue of fitna there are many many different types of fitna I mean there's the fitna of wealth there's the fitna of women there's the fitna of power and authority there's you know a list of different types of fitan that we could mention but at the end of the day we can classify them into two different categories it will be one of these two there's no third category those different temptations and trials and so on and so forth they will either fall under the category of shubuhat or shahawat these two different categories whether they be the shubuhat or the shahawat a person may ask which of them is more severe or more serious both of them fitna in both of them is something serious but which one is even more serious and the reality is wallahu alam that the fitna of the shubuhat is more serious than the fitna of the shahawat as far as shahawat are concerned a person's desires are concerned one may uh, you know fall to temptation one may do something wrong and event and it may be for a short period of time it may be for a longer period of time but eventually inshallah they will repent and come to their senses and they will abandon that it may have an effect but not as serious as that of shubuhat shubuhat these doubts that enter a person's heart um, they are the most dangerous because a person may eventually think that you know what this is the truth and so they will fight tooth and nail they will you know defend whatever it is that they are that they believe to be the truth and it could lead them out of Islam so the shubuhat are more serious if you will now when it comes to the uh, to the issue of, of uh, fitna there are several ahadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warns us of fitna take this example that hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said badiru bil a'mali khayra so he said basically uh, hasten towards doing good deeds why? He said because uh, fitna like a portion of a dark night in other words it will be very confusing wherein an individual wakes up as a believer and begins the night as a disbeliever or he begins the night as a believer and wakes up as a disbeliever you all remember that hadith be careful because the time will come when the fitna will be uh, so overwhelming people will not know right from wrong person may awaken start the day as a believer but by the end of the day they will be a disbeliever and vice versa be hasty in doing good deeds don't put off doing good deeds and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it will go to the extent that a person may sell his or her religion for the sake of this dunya to earn something uh, you know that's not even worth much in this world for some measly worldly gain a person may even give up their religion so he warned that a time will come when the fitna can be or will be that great he also told us to be cautious because the fitna or these different temptations and all sorts of trials they are presented to an individual day and night and there are some people who unfortunately will allow these fitan to creep into their hearts so he says sallallahu alayhi wa the meaning of the hadith he said that trials are presented to the heart repeatedly as a mat is woven or as a uh, as a straw mat is woven huh? straw by straw you, you know how the, the mats are woven so these fitan continuously are presented 
to the heart of a believer. So whichever heart absorbs it, in other words, you uh, fall to that temptation, you allow those doubts to creep in, Whoever, uh, who, whichever heart absorbs it, a black spot is blotched on it. And whichever heart deflects it, that is, rejects it, a white dot is spotted on it. And this continues until the hearts become one of two states. A whitened heart that is not harmed by any trial so long as the heavens and the earth remain, or a blackened, deviant heart that knows no good and rejects no evil except what, is absorb, uh, except what, uh, what it absorbs of its desires. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from having those black hearts. Now of course, we learn this meaning also from other hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that every time an individual commits a sin, then a black dot is placed on his or her heart. And as long as that individual repents, uh, seeks Allah's forgiveness and so forth, then that uh, spot will be removed. Otherwise, those dots will be placed on the heart continuously until it is completely covered and it is blackened and it is hardened and no good reaches that heart وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. So the Prophet as I said in many ahadith has given us these warnings to, to stay away from every type of fitna he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also told us about the straight path and how dangerous it is to deviate from that straight path. In the hadith that is reported by Imam Ahmad alayhi rahmatullah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Indeed, Allah has described a parable. He's given this example of as-sirat al-mustaqim, of the right path, the straight path. That path that leads to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that path that leads towards al-Jannah. And he said on the side, on the two sides of the path are walls with many unlocked doors, each door having a curtain. Okay, so imagine the straight line and then you have the two walls and many doors which have curtains covering them. There is a collar appointed at the head of as-sirat al-mustaqim that straight path and that caller is saying the following O people keep to this straight path don't look at or go on the crooked paths breaking off from it that is breaking off from the straight path when a person traveling this path wishes to open one of these doors then a caller calls out beware do not open it if you open it then you will adopt this path and leave as sirat al-mustaqim. I want that we pay close attention to this hadith and what all of those things symbolize. What does the straight path symbolize? Who is that caller at the end of that straight path? Who is that other caller that is saying, don't deviate, don't go that way. Otherwise, once you get in, it will be difficult for you to come out. Who are all of those? They are mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith. So he said again, the caller at the end of the straight path is saying, O people, keep to this straight path. Don't look at or go on the crooked paths breaking off from it. When a person traveling this path wishes to open one of these doors, then a caller calls out. This is from the words of the Prophet ﷺ. Beware, do not open it. If you open it, then you will adopt this path and leave as sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path. Now he explains what all of these things are. He says, as sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path is al-Islam. The way to Allah, the way to the pleasure of Allah, the way towards paradise or al-Jannah. And the walls are the hudud of Allah. That is, the boundaries and the legal limits laid down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the open doors are all those things which are haram. Those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden for us. And the caller at the end of the path, at the head of the path, as sirat al-mustaqim is the Qur'an. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the caller that says, do not enter that door. 
Do you know who that caller is? It is your conscience. It is your heart. This is why you find in the hadith, Istafti qalbak. You really want to know the answer? Ask yourself. Ask your heart. So the Prophet ﷺ says that that caller, because you know when you want to do something or when you are tempted to do something wrong, subhanAllah, there is something telling you in the back of your mind that this is not something good. This is something you wouldn't want anybody else to know about. Isn't that true? It's something that you would rather nobody knew you would be doing. Uh, this is that caller. The one that is warning you not to enter that door. So he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that that caller is that conscience which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted to the heart of every person possessing faith. A beautiful hadith found in, in, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad alayhi rahmatullah. Now, having said that, there are those when they do wrong and they are confronted, they may say, but you know, I feel absolutely fine with this. I have no problems with it at all. My conscience is clear. It is because that voice of reason, if we can call it that, as the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning here, has been drowned out. Now they don't hear that voice any longer. That caller is not, is not heard by them. They have drowned that voice out. And the reason for that, the reason or the, why that voice is concealed and hidden and drowned out is that these individuals have indulged so much in sin that the hearts have become blackened and no good reaches them. So that voice they are not hearing any longer. That conscience of theirs is not, is not leading them away from, is not leading them away from the evils. You know, when we speak about things like this, because we're talking about those many doors and those open doors are actually, uh, you know, the haram things, then people, people tend to respond to us by saying, but what, what's the matter? I mean, what kind of religion is this? Everything is haram. Every time you talk, you're talking about that which is haram. I mean, is there nothing left that is halal, that is allowed? Of course, these are people who have not understood and they are influenced by others from the outside. That is those who do not have faith. The reality though is this. And since we're talking about the, the shubuhat and the shahawat and so forth. When it comes to the issue of halal and haram. Let's make one thing clear. No one, no matter who they may be. Possesses the authority to make something halal and to make something haram. That is the sole right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course we say the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is simply conveying something from Allah. So it is the sole right of Allah. And when we say that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam declared this halal or haram, in reality we are saying Allah declared it halal or haram. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Because everything that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks of pertaining to our deen, pertaining to our religion is a revelation which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has revealed to him. Uh, so halal and haram, these are not matters for uh, any Tom, Dick and Harry to decide. They are not, they're, it's not even for the greatest of scholars to decide whether some, or to, to, you know, to, to declare something halal or haram unless they take it from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The ulama, the scholars, are the ones who will dig deep and will look for those answers. Not that, you know, my, my feeling is that it's halal. My feeling is that it's haram. <laughs> they, nobody has a right to do that. No. You're declaring this to be halal, you're declaring this to be haram, based on what? They will base it on the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in accordance to the understanding of our pious predecessors. Huh? The Qur'an, how did the Messenger of Allah 
understand those particular verses or ayat? How did the Sahaba understand them? Because they learned directly from the Prophet ﷺ and then those who followed uh, in, their, in their footsteps. So when it comes to the um, you know, fatwas and so on and so forth, one needs to be very cautious. Okay, because today you can get a fatwa for anything you want. This is how uh, easy it has become. But it's important that you and I realize that when it comes to our religion, when it comes to our deen, our Islam, we are dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not a matter to be taken lightly. It's a matter of heaven and hell. al jannatu wa nar Okay? Uh, we said that when it comes to the uh, fitna of a shahawat, then of course these are the most widespread. And the shahawat or the uh, temptations and so forth, uh, they are indeed very, very dangerous. When one, although we said the shubuhat, the fitna of shubuhat is greater, but we don't want to uh, diminish the issue of the fitna of a shahawat. These are serious and they could be so bad that an individual may leave Islam as a result of them. Because you not see that there are those who may leave their religion to follow a certain desire. A man may want to marry a certain woman or a woman may want to marry a certain man. And according to the Sharia, it is haram, it is unlawful for them to do so. There are those who may do it anyhow. But knowing it's wrong, deep down inside they know it's wrong. They do it out of weakness and, and, and whatever. And of course the danger in that is eventually they may, they may deem it to be okay. And it could take them out of Islam. But then there are those who outright, because they are so weak, they may abandon Islam for a man or a woman. And say the same thing about wealth and so on. So these fitan of a shahawat of the you know, desires are great indeed and they are plenty. One needs to be very cautious of them. So we said the fitna of wealth. And you are clearly aware of the ayat in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that yes, our wealth is a fitna. It is a trial. It is a test for us. The wealth is given to us. I mean, not to say that we are not allowed to collect wealth. We are not to work for wealth. No. Quite to the contrary. Earn as much as you want. Collect as much as you want. But as long as you stay within the confines of the Sharia. Don't compromise your religion for the sake of earning some wealth. Don't lie and cheat and steal and swindle for the sake of earning that wealth. There are those who have this sickness and they love power and authority. And you see what they do. Campaigning and slandering others and whatever it is, at the end of the day they want to be at a certain in a certain position. They want authority in the land. Without realizing that this comes with a great responsibility, that they will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding these things. Okay? So an individual has to be clear on these issues. There are many shahawat, there are many uh, things that one desires out there. Okay? But we have to strive against ourselves and understand that okay I have to look at this thing that I that I desire this thing that I want is it going to be good for me in my worldly affairs and my akhirah? if so then alhamdulillah I go after those things but if they are going to lead to my destruction in the world in this world as well as the hereafter or in the hereafter, then of course, these are things that I should avoid altogether. We gave those two examples of power and authority, of wealth. Now, there's one of them that I want to deal with a little bit more because this also brings about the issue of, uh, of shubuhat. In today's world, there are those who claim that Islam is a religion for men. It favors men. And from the proofs they, they give for that are those ahadith in which the Prophet wasallam warns us, the men, and he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the meaning of the hadith is that I have not left behind me 
a fitna, a temptation and a trial more harmful to men than women. Wow, it sounds so belittling of women. It sounds insulting towards women. This is how the enemies of Islam, and let me be clear on that, they are no more than enemies of Islam, those who claim these things. They will claim that these types of texts show you that Islam is anti-women. Islam is a, ma is a religion for men. Ayy. We want to come back and say that listen, there are certain things that we believe are constants. And there are certain things that we believe are absolutes. What is found in the Qur'an and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, these things are constants. These things are absolute truth. Now, if people want to misinterpret them, then this is their problem. But the texts are what they are. We will neither explain them away, nor will we apologize for them. So let's just come to this issue. Yes, the fitna of women is a great fitna. How many men have crumbled, have fallen because of them being tempted by women? So from that ayah, although it is speaking about you know, the, the status of men and, 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 and women, but what many of the ulama have understood that, listen, the same can, can apply the other way. There are women who are destroyed as a result of men also. The temptation is, 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 is you know, both ways. But, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ So Allah azza wa jal also mentions that from those things which are beautified for the people are women. So yes, Women are a fitna, but is it women in, of, in and of themselves who are a fitna? No. This is not what is meant. It is the fitna of certain women. That is women who choose not to follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down for them. Women who choose to disobey Allah jalla wa ala. And so they are flirtatious when they speak. So they dress in a manner that is unbecoming. That is not appropriate. And so of course they draw the attention of men. Yes, these are the women that the Prophet ﷺ is warning against. You and I also have to live with reality. You know, our problem today is that we live in, I don't know what type of world. People are blind to the truth that is in front of them. People are totally blinded. I don't know how come. Because those who are inviting to the batil and to falsehood, Sometimes their words can be so beautiful. They can mesmerize the people. The Prophet ﷺ warned us that the words of some people can be, for lack of better terms, magical, mesmerizing. Because they speak in, 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 in such a way, they can, subhanAllah, they can, they can convince people that black is white and white is black. It's because of the way they speak. The gift of the gad. Right? There are people who, who are like that, and that is what is happening today. So you find uh, people talking about Islam, and how we oppress women, and how, we, how could Islam possibly oppress women? When this is a religion, a way of life, that was prescribed for us by the creator of all things, and by the creator of mankind, subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could Islam oppress women? When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the kindest and the best of people towards women folk. When he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even told us that if you want to know the level of your Iman, how complete your Iman is, then look at how you treat your women folk. The best of you in faith are those who are best towards their women folk. And he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I am the best of you towards my women folk. Does that sound like a religion which would oppress women? So when we look at these texts, we should not react when we haven't understood the meanings of the texts. And do not allow the enemies of Islam, and do not allow people who do not possess Islamic knowledge to interpret and translate and explain these texts for you. 
فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون إن الحلال بين وإن الحرام بين وبينهما أمور مشتبهات لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس So these texts maybe to you are somewhat ambiguous and they are somewhat unclear What are you supposed to do then? You are supposed to go to the people of knowledge I mean real knowledge People who have devoted their lives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just somebody that looks like they know what they're talking about or sounds like they know what they are talking about this is not sufficient for us so the fact of the matter is that yes some women can be a great fitna for men again we do not want to be blinded by the words of the people but look at reality look at what is happening around us today those same people who say that Islam uh, oppresses women and silences women and so on and so forth they are the ones they are the ones who have made the woman a slave to the desires of people they are the ones who want women to be displayed in public for people to take advantage of them examples that we see around us each and every day look at what happens when they want to advertise anything what happens they try to choose the most beautiful of women to advertise perfume, to advertise chewing gum for God's sake. I mean, anything and everything. What does a beautiful woman have to do with that? This is only one thing. The type of clothing that they manufacture, the type of shoes, it, you look around you and what is it all about? The women, whether we like it or not, what has happened today is that they've made the woman such that she is judged first and foremost by her appearance her physical appearance the way that she dresses this is how women are judged whether we like it or not I mean a secret or maybe it's not such a big secret anymore but you know you look at many men who are not religious women may walk by them they may see a woman on on a television screen or wherever and between them they have this language where they say I give her an 8 I give her an 8 yeah they grade them out of 10 depending on your appearance and so on and so forth yeah some men can be dogs and they will speak in that way this is not appropriate this is not how we are supposed to treat women so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribes lowering of the gaze when he subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribes the hijab الحجاب. The hijab of many women today and hijab when I say it the first time is between quotation marks requires a hijab. What is the hijab? What is the purpose of the hijab? That's another topic on its own. But many don't even understand that. And so although they think although they think that they are covering up but they are not covering up as they should be covering up. And so they do become a fitna. In any event, I don't want to delve too much in that topic, but I do want to make it clear that the fitna of women, as the Prophet ﷺ said, is a real fitna. And it is, as he ﷺ said, the fitna that he is left behind for men, that, that he believes and he says is the most harmful of all, of, of all fitna. So let us be, let us be clear on that. But at the same time, let us not misinterpret the texts and uh, stray and start to think that, oh, you know, uh, Islam looks down on women. How could we? I mean, listen, women who follow in the footsteps of Khadija and Aisha radiallahu anhuma and uh, Fatima radiallahu anha, what, what are we, if we said that women were bad, women were in and of themselves a fitna what would we be saying about these three women? what would we be saying about uh, Asya, Imra'atu Fir'aun? Uh, are we saying these nasty things about them? obviously not Those, so these statements are not to be taken in, uh, in a general form such as that as a matter of fact look Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam who made those statements because you, you have to have that balance you have to look at things in perspective you have to look at them within context. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also told us about how you know this world is filled with, with, with different types of pleasures and enjoyments. 
And what did he say that you would find the most pleasure in? Al Mar'atu Saliha, the righteous woman. This is coming from the same man who said that this is the most dangerous of every fitna that he left behind. This is the thing he feared. But he sallallahu alayhi wasallam also told us that listen, when we look at this world and all of the pleasures that are in this world, the, the, the best of all that is that you will find in a righteous woman. So let's not go to any extremes. Let's make sure that we understand these texts and you don't look at one text and then you draw some conclusion. No, you look at that text, you try to understand it, you don't have the tools and the means to understand it well, you go to the people of knowledge who will explain it to you. Reading a few things online will not give you a full picture. Okay, this is, this is a great danger that we have today also where people think that just by researching themselves, by reading what is available out there on the internet and so forth, that they can, uh, you know, they can have the answers. No. Sometimes, it can be even more confusing. Why? Because you don't really know who it is that put that stuff out there. There are a lot of things that are packaged well and a person may be deceived into thinking that this is something authentic. No. We need to make sure. If you're going to make sure about things that concern your property and your wealth and your uh, personal safety and, uh, you know, and so forth, then what about when it is something concerning your well-being in the hereafter? Are we not going to make absolutely certain that it's you know, uh, coming from an authority, that it is something which is authentic? Even more so. We should make absolutely certain of that. The other thing I'd like to mention also is when we do go to ask about certain things because there are lots of doubts that will be placed in the minds of the people where people misinterpret texts and so on and so forth and we want to have a clear picture. Okay? As I said, it is not enough that you know one or two pieces of evidence. You know, you know an ayah or two. That, that, that's not enough. You know, there are so many things when we look at ayat and, and a hadith you have to know the context. You have to also understand or, or know whether or not something has been abrogate, abrogated. There, there, there are many things. The average person does not possess those tools. And this is why we say that we must go to the people of knowledge. One of the problems we have today though is that there are some who will go to people of knowledge but they already have preconceived ideas. They've already decided what they want the answer to be. And so if they do not get the answer that they are looking for from that person of knowledge, from that sheikh for example, then in their minds already this person is, is wrong. They, they want a particular answer. They go in that state of mind. So we need to be careful that we, uh, we are not amongst those individuals uh, as well. Ala kulli hal, fitnatu as as I said, are many. Uh, we are bombarded by them all the time and inshallah ta'ala at the conclusion uh, of, uh, of our gathering today we will speak a little bit about uh, about the ways that we can protect ourselves from fitan whether they be from the shubuhat or the shahawat let's move on now to the uh, fitan of uh, as shubuhat we said as shubuhat and this is pertaining uh, to doubts particularly doubts in religious matters. Sadly, I think today we face this perhaps more than previous generations. Because the callers towards falsehood and those who want to confuse between truth and falsehood are plenty and they have many different avenues the internet being one of them television being another right? there are just so many different channels through which they can uh, communicate <coughs> to the masses many of them of course have titles doctor so and so which you know sort of gives them some kind of authority and so the shubuhat are many
people will start causing you to doubt perhaps the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they'll put doubts in your heart and in your mind about a tawheed. They will put doubts in, 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 in your heart and in your mind about certain laws that Allah Jalla wa ala has prescribed. Here's where we want to take a few moments and make some things clear. I mean, we, we don't need to drag things out. We don't need to speak too much on them. But we need to identify where the problems are and then look at how we can rectify those problems. So the problem with the shubuhat, which are many, don't need to give examples. I think the one example we gave is probably sufficient when it comes to the issue of women. Uh, when it comes to the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll try to put doubts in our minds. Tayyib. As I said, the avenues are many. And so what is it that we should be doing? Especially when it comes to these shubuhat. The way out of them is to close the doors. This is why I will bring you back to that hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that we mentioned earlier on. Don't stray right and left. Some people think that it is good to read everything that comes your way. Not true. Not at all true. Read everything for the sake of quote-unquote knowledge. Billahi alaykum. There are people who will read, uh, 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 like right now, you know, some many hot topics. One of them is the issue of evolution. Okay, yes. People who don't understand the basics of Islam. People who don't really know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. are those whom if you were to talk to them about the basics okay come to the hadith on iman and tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi ila akhirih if you ask them about the basics they would not they, they don't possess the knowledge of those things and then they want to debate evolution they want to debate the existence of god look you know how many questions that i receive on a daily basis of people saying Oh, you know, I was on this site and there are a bunch of atheists discussing this issue and that issue. How do I respond to them? I mean, you, you don't know the basics of your religion. And you want to now get into debates with atheists? It is not my duty or yours to respond to everything that comes out there. Because there are going to be all of these doubts thrown out all of these misconceptions that are thrown out there, it is not for all of us to respond to them. There are people who are qualified, and yes, we can present it to them and let them deal with it. But for you to think that you are doing this great favor to humanity by going to all of these different sites and finding what people are saying about Islam and then responding, you know what happens? In many cases, in many cases, because they themselves don't have a sound understanding of Islam, they respond in a way that is incorrect also. And two wrongs don't make a right. So they may be saying things about Islam. And in order to respond, this person doesn't have knowledge. So they will just retaliate. Let me give you a simple example of slavery. Slavery is a big issue. Now, there are those who are out there, what kind of religion is that? And it has never denounced slavery and never completely abolished slavery. And you have those who are zealous and they'll go online and they respond, how dare you say such a thing? My religion abolished slavery 1400 years ago. Ya jahil. What kind of ignorance is that? Since, where is your evidence for that? Did Islam ever abolish slavery completely? No, but it restricted it. It completely uh, taught us how to deal with, with slavery and gave us all the details. But no, look at how many of them today will just go out and say, no, how can you say that our religion, you know. Uh, when it comes to the issue of hijab, 
the famous one? No, no, a woman's, uh, you know, hijab is in her heart. There's no obligation on a woman to cover. Yes or, or no? So many of them out there will, will respond in that way. Why? Because they don't have a proper understanding of the religion. So the shubuhat are out there. One of the best ways that we can avoid them is by us restricting ourselves to what we read and what we listen to. Yes, although there are those who say, read as much as you can of anything that comes your way. Listen to everyone. You never know. Yeah, you never know. You may be deceived by that person. You never know. You may be deceived by that article that you read. So do not open those doors. Keep those doors tightly shut. Restrict yourself. Refer to those books and those writers. Uh, refer to those speakers whom you know, insha'Allah ta'ala, are truthful. And who will not lead you astray. Don't be deceived by appearances. The length of a person's beard is not going to determine how knowledgeable they are or not. Nor is the length of their clothing. You get my point? But what matters is, what are their qualifications? How do they live their lives? Yes, because this is a big deal to you. You want to make sure that you're, you're taking from an individual who lives by the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet You're not going to find any angels out there to follow. كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمَ خَطَّى All of the children of Adam are prone to err. So you're not going to find anybody perfect, but you will find people whom SubhanAllah, Allah Jalla wa Ala has, has given us that, that fitrah that we can actually see through many things. If you are sincere about your religion, if you are sincere about something, SubhanAllah, you will see through many things. You will see through the facade that is presented by many people out there. You will see it. And you will see that Allah Jalla wa Ala will expose them sooner or later. So this is one of the things that we have to keep in mind. And I cannot stress it enough. Do not read everything that is out there. Do not depend on the internet for your Islamic knowledge. When you read, read from sources that you are certain, inshallah, to the best of your ability, you have uh, ascertained that they are authentic sources. Ask people around you whom you trust. Simply going on a search and how many sites out there which may seem to be beautiful and the words are beautiful but they belong to people who are opposed to Islam and of course in the beginning they want to attract you so they will mention all of these things and then as you go on you will see that they start uh, misinterpreting verses of the Quran they start misinterpreting a hadith of the Prophet wasallam. they start giving a great deal of misinformation about Islam and it leads people astray and we see it around us all the time. Uh, in the end, we want to look at a few things that we can do in order to protect ourselves from these fitan. And then we will end with a few words of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim alayhi rahmatullah. From amongst the things that will protect us from the fitan. And by the way, when it comes to these fitan of shubuhat, don't think that nobody should feel that, you know, my iman is so strong, inshallah, inshallah, you know, I will not be, um, I will not be led astray. This is deception. And it is conceit as well. For one to think that, you know, alhamdulillah, I am so knowledgeable and my iman is so strong that I'm not going to be led astray. I know right from wrong. No. There are many who, subhanAllah, yesterday perhaps we looked up to and today you have no idea what they're doing. Out of fear of mentioning those names, I will not even mention some of them. I'm talking about contemporaries today. Prior to 9-11, post 9-11, many people fell. Selling their deen. Many. And many whom, subhanAllah, yes, we believe that they were upon the truth and so on and so forth. But subhanAllah, that fitna came and they fell. I will be frank with you, there were many from amongst our you know, students of knowledge and so on and so forth whom uh, we respected and we even promoted their lectures and so on and so forth. But post 9-11 we had to pull everything and retract whatever we said about them. Because of those fitna that they were 
not able to, to survive through. May Allah Azza wa Jal still guide them aright. We don't wish evil upon them. In any event, uh, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam himself used to say, Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala al iman. Like if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to pray to Allah, used to supplicate and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O controller of the hearts, thabbit qalbi ala deenik, that keep my heart firm upon this religion. If he sallallahu alayhi wasallam felt the need to do so, then who am I? And who are any of us to think that our faith is so unshakable that no matter what we are exposed to, we will be okay? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he saw the scriptures from the people of the book in the hands of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arba, was he not upset and angry? So then... Who can claim that their iman is stronger than that of Umar radiallahu an? So you think reading anything and everything is good for you? It will broaden your horizons? No, it could be to your detriment. It could be the reason that one of us falls. That, that one article may impact us so negatively. Inshallah at the end we can... I just wanted that point to explain about... Just what you mentioned in the last sentence. I didn't understand. No. I said that if we think that reading anything and everything out there is good for us, it is not because we may be influenced by something that is so deviant but it's just the way it was put across that it sounded so beautiful and the shaitan gets us at that time and we may go astray as a result of that because of those arguments that some people put out there. And then we don't have ample knowledge to be able to, to counter those arguments. What are some of the most important things that we can do? First and foremost, ad-du'a, ad-du'a. We can never emphasize that enough. The hearts are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ الْقُلُوبَ بَيْنَ إِسْبَعِينِ مِنْ أَصَابِ الرَّحْمَانِ يُقَلِّبُهَا كَيْفَ يَشَاءَ أَوْ كَمَا قَالْ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ So our hearts are between two fingers of the fingers of Ar-Rahman, the Most Merciful. He turns them as, as He wishes. So we beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or we should beg of Allah jalla wa ala, on a regular basis. And as I said to you, even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Ya musarrif al-qulub, sarrif qalbi ila ta'atik. The one who controls the hearts, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam is begging of him, to turn his heart towards the obedience of Allah. So for us to turn to Allah on a regular basis, to keep us firm upon this straight path, to keep us away from deviation, to open our eyes and keep them open to the truth, and to keep our hearts open to the truth, and to protect us from the many fitan, ma zahara minha wa ma batan, those which are apparent and those which are hidden. This is all found in the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam where you should seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from every type of fitna. We see in our salah, at the end of the salah, you seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from four things. From amongst them, fitna tul mahya wal mamat. So we constantly beg of Allah's assistance and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us firm upon the straight path. The next thing for us to remember is that we need to adhere very closely to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet And so, when it comes to all these things that we are reading, you cannot read anything better than the Qur'an. You cannot read anything better than the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Now, for those of us who don't have an understanding, a proper understanding of the Arabic language and so on and so forth, then of course, it is our duty to seek out those works in which reliable, trustworthy scholars explain these ayat, the tafsir of the Qur'an, and explain for us the ahadith of the Prophet How many of us has read, for example, a work on 
let me not even say Sahih al-Bukhari, but a work on the commentary of the 40, you know, ahadith, uh, al-ahadith al-Nawawiyyah. For example, that selection, 40 hadith selected by al-Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala, because these ahadith, you know, are the ones that our religion basically revolves around. How many of us have taken the time out to read these and to understand them? So many of these shubuhat, I mean, look, today, from the shubuhat, People will say to you, you know, if your God is so merciful, then how come there's so much war in the world? How come people are dying of starvation? Where's the mercy of your God? Do you hear that or not? If you read the ahadith, and before that of course the Qur'an, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and understand it, then you will not be affected by these shubuhat that are thrown out there. So adhering to the Qur'an, and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and by that I mean studying them. Even for the fitan of the, the shahawat, what are you going to find in the Qur'an? What are you going to find in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? You will find that Allah and His Messenger ﷺ warn us of the dangers of those shahawat, of those temptations, of those trials and those tests. We will learn what they are. We will learn how to avoid them. Simple examples again. وَالْعِيَادَ بِلَا الزِّنَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا He says وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا Don't go anywhere near it. In other words, everything that could lead towards it, stay away from it. And then he lays down guidelines of how we are to conduct ourselves, both parties, men and women. The issue of lowering our gaze. The issue of the tone that we use when we speak to one another how we are to be dressed. All of this is found in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, teaching us how to stay away from these shahawat. Warning us of the evil consequences of those shahawat. You find them where? In the Qur'an and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So adhering closely to them takes on two meanings then for us. One is learning them. Learning what is in the Qur'an, learning what is in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and along with that, developing a taqwa by implementing what we learn. It is not important only for us to learn these things and to memorize them and to know them, but what is more important afterwards is for us to apply them in our lives to the best of our ability. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ To the best of our ability. And if we slip up, of course, we're taught what to do then as well. There's the door of Tawbah, which is, which is open. So seeking knowledge, adhering to these things. Al-A'malu uh, Saliha. There is nothing like us making certain that we engage ourselves in working righteous deeds. If you think about all the good that we could be doing, SubhanAllah, how much time then will be taken away from those things which could lead us towards the shahawat and shubuhat. At the beginning of the day, I want you now to picture at the beginning of the day, the early part of the day, in the morning, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked his companions, who has visited someone who is sick today? Who has given charity today? Who is fasting today? Who followed a janazah today, a funeral procession today? At the beginning of the day, Abu Bakr and Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda responded in the affirmative to each of those questions. At the beginning of the day. Not halfway through, not at the end of the day, at the time of Maghrib. In the early part of the day. He responded in the affirmative. How many of us, by the time 10 o'clock comes around, could answer in the affirmative to many of these questions. How many of us, by the time 9 or 10 a.m. comes about, we've already given sadaqah, we've already recited a portion of the Qur'an, I and mean, inshallah we'll take for granted, we all prayed Salat al-Subh, Salat al-Fajr. How many of us would have uh, at least done a good portion of the adhkar of the morning? How many of us? So then, another way of protecting ourselves from these shubuhat and these shahawat is by 
protecting ourselves through righteous deeds. Keep yourself busy. There's so much we can do. Think carefully. These righteous deeds don't have to necessarily be huge things. But go out of your way to, to do certain things. Consciously smile in the face of a believer. Consciously look for someone whom you can give charity to. See if there's a Muslim who is ill and whether you can visit them or not or at least give them a phone call and ask about them. Contacting relatives. There are so many things. It's not only what some people think that you know it's only standing in prayer and no, that's part of it. How many of us who waste hours on end surfing the net reading this and reading that take the time to pray at least two rak'ah of salat al-duha and so forth so keeping ourselves busy with righteous deeds is one of the best ways also another of them is a dhikr remaining in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ And the remembrance of Allah is greater. And as we learn from the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a protection for us against the shaitan. Those whispers of the shaitan that may lead us towards fulfilling certain shahawat that we are to stay away from from the shubuhat so remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any event these as I said are just a few of the major things that we can do so we said ad-du'a we said learning the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then applying it in our lives after understanding it well working righteous deeds Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are some of the most important things that we can do. I want to read to you then, in conclusion, a few words from Imam Ibn al Qayyim, alayhi rahmatullah. And he has a lot of work, mashallah, on uh, issues of the heart. He's done, uh, he, he's written a great deal um, on, the, uh, on the topic of the, the shubuhat and the shahawat. But just a few quick things, um, not even everything, but. Uh, Okay. And Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says There is no doubt that the heart becomes And this is just one quotation And then we'll read uh, something else He says there is no doubt that the heart becomes covered with rust Or it becomes tarnished Just as metal dishes uh, and silver and, and their like Become rusty and tarnished So the rust of the heart Or the, uh, you know, when the, the heart that is tarnished It is polished with dhikr that is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It says, dhikr polishes the heart until it becomes like a shiny mirror. However, when dhikr is abandoned, the rust or the tarnish returns. And when it commences, then the heart again begins to be cleansed. Thus the heart becoming rusty or tarnished is due to two matters. Sins, one, and ghafla or negligence. That is, uh, negligence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala neglecting the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise it is cleansed and polished by two things istighfar which is seeking uh, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dhikr or the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he also says rahimahullah fitna is of two types the fitna of shubuhat that is uh, doubts and misunderstandings this one being the greater fitna of the two and the fitna of shahawat or desires. It is quite possible that these two can be present in an individual at the same time or one of them may be within an individual to the exclusion of the other. Then he says regarding the, the fitna of shubuhat or doubts and misunderstandings and misconceptions, this is due to having a weak vision and a lack of knowledge. I think we mentioned this very clearly. A lack of knowledge. Not to mention if this is accompanied by corrupt intentions and the goal of fulfillment, fulfillment of one's desires. And this is where I was talking about people having certain preconceived ideas because of how they have been influenced by the opponents and the enemies of Al Islam and of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, 
And herein lies the greatest of all fitna. This is indeed the worst of afflictions. Say what you like about the deviation of evil motives. The dominant factor in such a person is his or her hawa, that is, desires, huh? base desires, and not huda, not guidance. In addition to his weak vision and lack of knowledge, which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa warned against. Okay. Uh, he says, he is like those whom Allah describes, they follow but a guess, in other words, conjecture. And that which they themselves desire, whereas they are surely, uh, there has surely come to them the guidance from their Lord. So many people, of course, they want to, and, and this is what I was talking about when they may go to somebody who has knowledge, and in their minds and in their hearts, they already know what they want. So they are not going to learn the truth, they want what will satisfy them. And this ayah, amongst other things, refers to that sort of thing. That is, the truth is there, but they don't want to hear it. They've already decided that what they have concluded is the right thing. Because that's what they desire. That is what they want. So whatever they hear, no. They will continue asking until they get that interpretation that they are looking for. وَالْعِيَادُ billah. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us that the following of desires misguides one from Allah's path. He says, in the meaning of the ayah, O Dawood, verily, we have placed you as a successor on earth. So judge between people in truth and justice, and follow not your desire, for it will mislead you from the path of Allah. Verily, those who wander astray from the path of Allah have a severe torment, because they forgot the day of reckoning. And this is again why I mentioned to you, our deen is to be taken seriously. Let's not forget, it doesn't end here. After we die, we have to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can try to justify things all we like here. We can try to pull the wool over people's eyes. But eventually, we have to answer to Allah wa ta'ala. This is the kind of fitna which leads to kufr, that is disbelief and nifaq or hypocrisy. Which is the fitna of the hypocrites and the people of innovation. According to the degree of their innovations. Thus the majority of them innovate because of the fitna of shubuhat. Doubts and misunderstandings and misconceptions. Whereby they confuse the truth with falsehood and guidance with misguidance. Now he mentions, there is no salvation from this kind of fitna except by exclusively following the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By appointing him as the judge in the fine detailed matters in the deen and simpler ones, the public aspects of one's life and the private ones, his beliefs and his actions, his reality and his legislation. Thus he takes from him, that is the Prophet wasallam, the reality of iman or faith and the legislation of Islam. He also accepts from him wasallam all that he has confirmed from Allah's names and attributes and actions and he does not negate them in the same manner he accepts from him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the obligations of salah its time and the number that is the number of prayers per day the percentage of one's wealth on which zakah is due and those who deserve it this is what I mentioned earlier following and adhering to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when you hear people uh, trying to explain away certain ahadith, then, you know, signals should go off. Red lights should go off. Danger. And this person is now trying to tell me that the Prophet ﷺ taught things and they were only good for a certain time. You know, you hear that. It's one of the big shubhas today. But that was relevant in his time. Look at, even in the hudud, we have this person in Canada who is, you know, considered to be a da'iyah. And up to this day, has a program on TV, let the Qur'an speak, and, you know, and he goes on about the hudud. So he's talking about, say for example, the amputation of the hand. He said that in those days was applicable, but today we have better alternatives. We have prison and we have, yeah, subhanallah. These are words of kufr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it in the Qur'an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama practiced it. Those who came after him, the Khulafa and others, they practiced it. And here you come today telling us there's a better alternative to what Allah prescribed and what his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallama prescribed and practiced. 
How can that be? This is when I say all these you know, red lights should be going on. But this is what Allah says. Stoning of the adulterer and the adulteress. Is there a better alternative? Of course, the enemies of Islam will try to tell you that yes, there are other alternatives. A person who apostates, what is the hukum, what is the ruling on that individual? Oh, but it's so harsh and how, what about freedom of religion? All these different shubuhat. But what did Allah say? And what did His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? And this is why he says, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, that there's no way for you to be saved from these shubuhat except by following, exclusively following the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and making him the judge between us. Of course, this is the guidance of Allah Jalla wa ala. فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ So he says, he does not accept nor take anything except if, if it is from him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for all the uh, for all the guidance around uh, anyway for all the guidance is, is is found in his statements and his actions and everything which is outside of his guidance is balal it is deviation all right so this is some of what al imam ibn al qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala mentions then he uh, continues and he speaks of the shahawat and he says allah has indeed combined in the following ayah the description of those whom you know those who uh, of the two types of fitna uh, those who have been afflicted with the two types of fitna uh, the meaning of the ayah in surah at-tawbah like those before you they were mightier than you in power and more abundant in wealth and children they had enjoyed their portion a while so enjoy your portion a while as those who before you enjoyed their portion a while and you indulged in play and pastime and he Gives the meaning of it in telling lies against Allah and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they indulge in play and pastime. Such are they whose deeds are in vain in this world and in the hereafter. Such are they who are the losers. So Allah is pointing out to us here what happens from the corruption of the hearts and the deen because of taking pleasures in their portion, that is, of this world, and indulging in speaking about falsehood. And this is so because corrupting one's deen occurs either by falsehood and engaging in it or by doing deeds which contradict correct action. Then he says the cure for these two fitna. As for the fitna of shubuhat, this can be prevented and cured by possessing al-yaqeen, that is certainty of faith. And fitna of shahawat can be fended off and remedied by a sabr patience. In other words, practicing self-restraint. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made leadership of this deen by possessing these two qualities when he said the meaning of the ayah and we made from among them leaders giving guidance under our command when they were patient and used to believe with certainty in our ayat. Surah the sajda ayah 24. Thus, this indicates that by having patience and certainty, one achieves leadership in this religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also interlined these two characteristics in Surah Al-Asr where he says, uh, the meaning of the ayah, except those who believe and do righteous good deeds and recommend the truth to each other and recommend one another to patience. Uh, as we said, the, the topic is a very broad topic. We wanted to summarize and make things as simple as possible. And we beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from every type of fitna. Because they are many, many indeed. I know I have said it many a time, but I will say it again. Be very careful whom you take your deen from. It is not a matter of convenience. We shouldn't look for that which is convenient to us. We should look for that which we feel confident will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and which will prepare us for the meeting with Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. طيب, if there are any uh, comments or, or questions, inshallah we can, we can deal with them now. Yeah.
kind of things they really do and then not to follow them anymore. So he used to confuse because you think that this person is really qualified and he has all the qualification that you mentioned that we should look for in a speaker. But now, you know, I have doubts in my mind whether I'm following the right. This is again another one of the fitan that we face today. You know, people speak. This is a problem. People say anything and everything. And they hide behind all sorts of names. We really don't know who they are. So again, I would recommend. When it comes to, let's say for example, some of these speakers that you're listening to. Uh, it may be a YouTube clip or other than that. And there are people who comment afterwards. Oh, this person is a deviant, this person is that, and this person is, is, is that. I mean, some of the greatest scholars have been uh, accused of blasphemy on these types of, or in these types of comments. So, stay away from those comments as well. Ask people whom you are confident with. Somebody, for example, you know, who is from the people of knowledge, that you are very confident about. Okay? You ask them directly. You have people around you, alhamdulillah. You can ask them, listen, I'm inclined to listen to this speaker. What do you say? As opposed to looking at all those comments on, you know, at the bottom, after the clip. People writing and responding and refuting and so on and so forth. If we waste our time in those things, you won't listen to anybody. And uh, you lose out. You lose out in every way. So avoid even looking at those things. I really highly recommend that because um, it, can, it can really lead you down the wrong path. Because then you might become one of those individuals whose favorite pastime, not even a pastime, unfortunately, who's, uh, who ends up spending the majority of their time talking about others. Oh, did you know that this sheikh is, is uh, don't even call him a sheikh, you know, he's, he's deviant. You know that one? Um, I heard, I heard, you know, I saw, I, somebody wrote that he shook a woman's hand once. And, you know, all that, so your, your time will be spent speaking about this person and that person and what they may or may not have done. So they make you more and more confused. Until finally you'll be like, you know what, there's nobody out there that we can trust. And so the movie channel becomes more beloved to you than anything else. Allah Hamza. You mentioned just now about you uh, mentioned um, a Rasul saw um, Umar ibn Khattab radhi Allah anhu. Cool or something. I, yes. I, I didn't okay. That. So you know how there are people who think today that mashallah, you know, um, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to read the Torah just to broaden my horizons and. and has that person even read the whole Qur'an? You want to read other scriptures. I'm not saying that nobody is to do that. There are those, insha'Allah ta'ala, who uh, you know, have read the entire Qur'an and maybe even memorized it and who have great knowledge of the meanings contained within the Qur'an and they study some of the other texts in order to be able to respond to the many doubts that are raised by Christians and by Jews and so on and so forth. They are a specialized group of people and we leave it to them. But you know now we have the Qur'an first and foremost that we need to focus on. So even Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, when he had one of those scriptures in his hand, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam rebuked him. Said, no, you need to focus on the Qur'an. And remember this is a time when the Qur'an was still being really revealed. And so we, we do find today that people want to get, you know, delve into all of that. But why? You haven't even understood the Qur'an correctly yet. And then some of them will say, you know, but all of these books are from Allah. Okay. But are you aware that Allah Jalla wa'ala took it upon Himself only to preserve the Qur'an as it came down? And the other books have been deviated. So there have been additions made to it. Things that have been deleted and so on and so forth. Things that have been distorted. Who are you? to be able to judge what is and what isn't right in those books. And so they may use those books to try and explain the Qur'an, whereas it's supposed to be the other way around. Okay, so this is what, uh, this is what we meant by that. Wallahu a'lam. Anything else? Alright, we'll leave it at that, inshaAllah.